Anyway, um, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, yeah, just real quick, I've been in the green industry about 30 years, a little over 30 years. Started out working in uh, the golf business years ago, back in the 80s, and um, decided that, you know, I took that as a summer job in high school and uh, college, and decided, you know, I you know, really like seeing those guys out there working. I enjoyed being outside and uh, decided to change my major and uh, go to school to be a golf course superintendent. So, um, long story short, I did that for about 10 years, spent some time in, in the Midwest where I grew up, um, down in South Florida to get some warm season turf experience. And then uh, you kind of ended my golf course career in right here outside of Durham, up at uh, Trayvon Country Club. Are there, are there any superintendents in here or golf course employees? Sort of. <laughs> Give these guys, guys a lot of credit. It's a tough gig to stay with. So 10 years was enough for me. So that led me to, to go into wholesale distribution for about 20 years. Um, last last eight years, I've been with a company called Miramichi Green. So um, just real quick about Miramichi Green. <clears throat> Usually the first question I get is, you know, it's a strange name, where does that name come from? Um, to make a really long story short, we are co-owned by the singer Justin Timberlake. And you know, those those you may not know, he's a really good golfer. He grew up near Memphis, and um, his part of his family heritage is Native American. And the golf course that he grew up playing when he was a youngster uh, really became in disrepair. So his dad, his dad and mom, his mom dad used to live in that neighborhood, and said, you know, hey, your your golf course is you know, your home golf course looks pretty terrible. We should invest some money and kind of rebuild it kind of give back to the community type of thing. So, you know, long story short, he hired some consultants to drive around the golf course and say, okay, we want to rebuild this golf course, what's it going to take? Um, it's all said and done. It was um, in such bad shape that they pretty much had to rebuild most of the golf course. So he said, okay, if I'm going to do that, then I want to make it you know, green and sustainable, um, you know, with the idea of, hey, let's have less inputs on water, that's simple, that's on fertilizer, fungicide, things like that, that you need to build a golf course. So he hired some soil scientists, he hired some chemists to come up with products that would allow minimal inputs to get that done. So, um, you know, the abbreviated version is he did that. That, that golf course got some accreditations, uh, the first in the U.S. to get Audubon Gold certified, as well as a Scottish GEO certification. So, um, so it was all said and done. We said, hey, we've proved, we've proven that you know, we can use you know, use some of these products to allow water saving, fertilizer saving, that type of thing. They were able to back into the math and say, hey, we save you know, X amount of dollars. There's got to be a way that we can market this for other golf courses, municipalities, landscapers, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> he, he called the, the golf course Miramichi Golf. So in, in Cherokee, that name means a place of happy retreat. So that's where the name came from. So we're, we're borrowing that name from his golf club calling our company, Miramichi Green. We have the rights to uh, some of the soil amendments and some of the chemicals that we're going to talk about. So let's get started. Um, I'm not going to turn this into a sales pitch, obviously. This is a CEU course. What we're going to do is really talk about um, how to read a soil test, a couple of important things to look at on the soil test. If there are problems, how do we fix those problems? We're going to talk about a couple of different ways that maybe are not the mainstream, or at least they haven't been, in, you know, up until the last few years. So just kind of opening up our minds to look at, you know, some solving solutions, some different ways. But, you know, we've got a line of soil amendments. We've got some fertilizers combined with um, biostimulants. We've also got some natural pesticides, including a weed control and a pest control. Um, you know, just you know, kind of toot our horn a little bit. I mean, you know, those of you that know me, um, again, I've been around a long time doing either on your side of the fence or as a distributor. Um, those of you who do know me probably know I'm not, you know, not like a born salesperson, but you know, if I had a sales pitch, you know, this would be it, right? If we've got some high name companies using these products, trusting these products, you know, golf courses, athletic fields, um, parks and rec, so, you know, really my point of all that is, hey, if these people can trust, put their trust in some of these products, then 
it's certainly good enough for Mrs. Smith's front yard, my wife's garden, that sort of thing. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to be around this afternoon, obviously. We so have some cards up here, some catalogs. Um, there's my, my info there if you want to scan that later on. But we'll go ahead and get started. So, you know, if we think about <clears throat> soil health, you know, it really it combines a lot of different things, right? So, you know, our focus in Miramichi is not necessarily the plant. Our goal is, hey, if we can get the soil healthy, it doesn't matter if I'm talking about a golf green, front yard, tomato plants, that plant's going to be healthier. So, um, we're going to kind of talk about how, how do we get there. So, <clears throat> if you guys remember back in, this is probably, you know, sixth grade uh, social studies, we learned about the dust bowl. Right, you know, terrible erosion control practices, um, planting practices weren't, you know, really sustainable. They didn't know any better back then, right? So, on top of the depression, they had a dust bowl, which you know, terrible erosion, lots of drought, um, you know, terrible time for America. So, you know, even back in the '30s, you know, FDR recognized the importance of soil health. So, pretty famous quote, right? <clears throat> a nation that destroys the soil destroys itself. So, you know, that's going to kind of be our theme today. So what is, you know, talk about the synergistic effect between the soil and plant. I kind of mentioned this before. But if you think about the, the plant in that soil, there's a lot of different nutrients interaction going on between even the root hairs that we can't see with our naked eye, all these, um, these, these different um, elements that affect that plant. So, you know, synergistically, if all this works together, then that plant's going to be healthier. So, we talk about how we get there. So this is a lot of long, you know, obviously it's blurry, we're not going to be able to read all this, but we're talking about the importance of um, soil health, even if you know, USDA, different companies are talking about the importance of carbon, right? So, you know, remember back in eighth grade science, carbon's a building block of life, right? So all living things can, you contain carbon. There's, you know, talk about carbon sequestration, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, putting it back into the, into the soil for plant health. So again, as, as part of Miramichi Green, that's a lot of what we do. Um, you can go online and read a lot of different studies about carbon sequestration and that sort of thing. Um, to me, the easiest um, analogy for trying to understand soil science is thinking about soil as a reef. So. You know, we've all seen, we've all either seen in person or in pictures, say like a coral reef, right? So think about how alive that system is. You've got microorganisms in there feeding off the coral. You've got little fish feeding off those microorganisms, big fish feeding off the little fish, so on and so forth. So compare that to say like a swimming pool. There's nothing there, right? There's nothing alive. So. Um, think of your soil that same way. I mean, it's kind of the big fish eat little fish scenario. The more biology that you have going on in that soil, the healthier that's going to be compared to, say, a swimming pool. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so what, what makes up soil? So, can everybody hear me okay? I can't tell if I'm getting feedback on here or not. Um, so, if we were to say, okay, let's take a lab. I want to make the perfect soil in a lab. What's that going to look like? So, in a perfect world scenario, we're going to have 25% water, 25% air, 45% mineral, 5% organic. Okay, so that's an ideal situation, right? So what is reality? More than likely, this is your reality if you're in the field, right? This is a, obviously a construction site. So this soil that they've, you know, they've essentially scraped off whatever we call topsoil, so that medium that they have right there to build either a parking lot or a building is exactly the opposite of what we would want for plants. And again, it doesn't matter if it's a you know flower bed or you know say a a, a sod um, field. That's not what we want, right? That's compacted. It's flat. There's probably no organics in there. So what do we do to change that to make that a more you know feasible growing medium for what we're trying to do? So sinkholes, right? This is huge in Florida. I think this is out in California, landslides, fires, you know, it seems like something's like a catastrophe out that way. So tell these people that 
soil health is an important. It's not just for plants, but it's for home structures, building structures, that type of thing. So, you know, in the past, we've really concentrated on uh, the chemical properties of soil, right? There's really three properties. There's chemical, biological, and physical. So we're going to... Roll one. Oops. All right. Sorry about that. So um, there's, there's, there's physical properties, chemical properties. Um, of soil in the past has been chemical properties, right? We, we're, we're quick to throw a fungicide at something or an insecticide at something. I think, you know, as a whole, we're looking at soil more as a holistic approach. Hey, maybe there's some physical characteristics we can change, maybe uh, some cultural practices, that sort of thing. So in order to do that, we need to talk about soil structure. So no matter where you are in the world, you're going to have really three types, three, three parts of your soil sand, silt, and clay, and then kind of in the middle is loam, um, but really sand, silt, and clay are the big three. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. That's called the soil triangle. Uh, when you get a soil test, sometimes they'll show that depending on um, you know, how in-depth that soil, soil is, but you, you're essentially reading you know, where those lines all intersect. That's going to tell you what type of soil that is. So, you know, first question is, well, well why is that important? Um, Really, it's important for a couple of different reasons. Um, and part of it's going to be, um, you know, infiltration, right? So, you know, sand your soil is going to take you know, more water, right? It's going to dry out soon, sooner because it, it flushes. Um, clay soil is going to be more compact, less likely to drain. So it's going to need be, be less water. You know, there's some fungicides or some chemicals out there. The rates will actually be different depending on your soil type. So that's why it's important to kind of know what you're looking at. So, um, you know, getting, getting back to grade school level stuff, you know, we've probably done this before back in science class, but a real quick, easy way to kind of determine what, what type of soil do I have, do a jar test. You fill up a jar about half full of soil, fill the rest up with water, give it a shake, let it settle out. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the heaviest particles are going to go down first to the bottom. Um, obviously, the mid-weight stuff's going to go in the middle. Clay's always the lightest, that's going to be at the top. So, um, you know, sand's always going to be the heaviest particles. So that kind of gives you a snapshot, these layers of what you're dealing with. It's not, it's not going to be perfect, but at least you kind of get an idea of, of what you're looking at. Um, again, a lot of this is going to be common sense, right? So I mentioned sand obviously is going to drain quicker. Silt's going to be kind of in the middle. Clay's going to, you know, drain a lot, a lot slower. So. You, you need to adjust your irrigation systems differently for each type of soil. Again, some fertilizer and chemical recommendations can be different as well. So <clears throat> I'll spend a ton of time on this. A lot of this, like I already mentioned, it's kind of common sense. Um, you know, the real takeaway for this one is organic matter is probably going to help, you know, 99% of the soils we have, right? Because there's almost no such thing anymore with, you know, urban expansion and that type of thing. We don't have the topsoils we had even 30 years ago. So anytime we can think about it, we're adding organic matter, carbon-based materials, soil is going to be that much healthier. So, you know, I mentioned the USDA talking about the importance of soil health. You know, really they're talking about regulating water, sustaining plant and animal life, filtering buffing, buffering pollutions, cycling nutrients, and providing physical stability and support. So we already showed some slides on you know, kind of what some of that looks like. So a little further here. So how many people here uh, take soil tests for their properties or managing? That's good. Um, you'd be surprised number of hands that I don't see when we do these. Um, you know, I think the importance of of that. I, I kind of use the analogy of going to the doctor once a year, right? To get get a physical. If you you know, you might have an underlying issue you don't know about. They can do blood work, um, maybe catch something before it becomes a problem, adjust medications, that sort of thing. You know, think of your soil as the same way. So a lot of times we get questions like, hey, how often do I want to take a soil test? You know, really, um, a couple of things come to mind. One would be if you're, if you're inheriting a new property, say you just got a new 
property, you have no history on what was done to that. How do you know that somebody already didn't put pre emergent down and here it is late February? Are you going to double dose that thing thinking you're going to put your pre emergent down? That could be an issue. Um, you know, the question might be hey, I've been doing the same program for, you know, say 10 or 15 years on this property, same fertilizer regimen, that sort of thing. For whatever reason, it's not responding. You know, things like that are indications that, hey, maybe something's wrong. Maybe we can't see with the visual eye, but we can send it you know, to one of our distributors, NC State, uh, get a soil test, kind of get a snapshot of, of what's going on. So <clears throat> we're really going to talk about two, two things that um, we want to look at. You can, depending on the soil test you get, some are more diagnostic than others. Um, but really, the, the two main things we want to focus on today is pH and CPC and how to correct those. So, so what is pH? So I'm sure everybody's heard of pH, right? So it's a scale of one to fourteen. Seven, obviously, being the center. Um, you know, most plants want to grow in that six to seven range. You know, here being in Raleigh, I lived in Raleigh, you know, twenty years ago. I'm sure, nothing's changed. I remember seeing soil tests that were. 4.9, 5.2, um, not a very good pH for growing. We're going to you know, talk about why that is uh, and maybe how to change that. Um, and then the other is going to be CEC. So cation exchange capacity, you may or may not have heard that, that term before. Um, in a nutshell, it's you know, simple terms. It's your, your soil's ability to interact with, with the micronutrients and the ions in the soil. So a lot of that exchange goes on. If that is a very low number, say single digits, you're not getting that exchange, you're not getting the full benefit of your fertility and probably a lot of your pesticides too. Usually when low CECs, we see um, a high sand content, very low organic matter. So you think about a golf green, sports fields, you know, a lot of those people are growing, trying to grow turf on sand, you know, maybe for compaction issues, right? They get a lot of traffic. Um, they're going to have low CDC soils simply because they don't have organic material uh, and natural soil in there. So we're going to talk about, you know, look at some of these samples and, and how we have changed this. So <clears throat> you'll see, you see, here's, here's some examples of some of these micronutrients trying to interact with that plant. So that main stem you see right there would be what we could see with the naked eye for the dig up plant. What's really doing the work are these tiny little what we're going to call root hairs that you normally can't see unless you have a microscope. But that's all interchanging, interacting with, with these micronutrients. So that CEC, the cation exchange capacity, is really what's kind of um, interacting and making that synergistic effect we talked to kind of at the beginning. All right, so we've, we've talked a little bit about some of these things, you know, core nutrients, um, talk about CEC, talk about pH. <clears throat> so I know it's late in the day, if we can remember one thing on this slide, this is probably the most important slide, I think, of, of at least my presentation. So we talked about the importance of pH. If you look at the center, I know it may be blurry there in the back, I, I can barely see it from here, but 6.2 to 7.3 is that square in the middle the reason that's important, that's that's the maximum availability of both your macronutrients, which is your N, P, and K, which you see in your typical fertilizer, and then a lot of the micronutrients. So if you look from 6.2 to 7.3, that's the most availability of all those nutrients. All those nutrients. If you go to one side or the other, look how much that drops. All right, so the importance of that is, and that, again, that doesn't matter if we're talking about Mrs. Smith's front lawn, a tomato plant. Um, most, you know, there's there's certain plants obviously that maybe are a little different. We want a lower or higher pH, but in general, this is where it needs to be. And you, you all that have taken soil tests understand. I mean, especially here, native soil is usually pretty low. So, you know, normally we're adding lime, right, to kind of raise the pH to get it into that um, that realm. We're going to talk about some different ways of trying to fix that you know, without using lime. Um, everybody probably knows this, but just as a refresher, you know, what, what is the old adage, up, up, down, and all around for your macronutrients? So <clears throat> if you think um, you take a 
any fertilizer brand, doesn't matter. They're all gonna have MP and K listed in that order, right? So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those are simply percentages by weight of what's in that bag. So the adage of up, down, and all around, think about nitrogen up, right? So green color, growth, phosphorus down, so that's um, you know, root growth, flowering, fruit bearing type things. And then all around would be your potassium. So think of potassium kind of as a, as a stress reliever, antioxidant type of thing for plants. <clears throat> and again, it doesn't matter you know, what brand it is, they're all gonna have NP or K. If it's a zero, 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 that means there's no nitrogen, no phosphorus. It's gonna be all potassium. So I'm sure everybody knows that's the one. And salt intelligence just you know, so we kind of know what we're talking about. So here's a typical soil test, right? So I believe this actually came from, from NC State. I've circled a couple of things we're gonna talk about, right? So if you see this pH, I know you probably can't read that in the back, but pH up there on the kind of left-hand side of the page, 5.2, it's pretty typical, right, for this, for this area. Um, I live in East Tennessee right now, very similar to where I live, um, heavy clay, lots of rock, low pH. Um, Look at the top of the circle. This this came right from that soil test. They're recommending 50 pounds per thousand square feet of lime. That's what we're used to seeing, right? We're going to add lime, raise that pH. The other circle at the bottom left is the CEC 5.0. That's low, right? That means there's not a whole lot of interaction. There's not a whole lot of biological activity in that soil. So what are we going to do to change that? Um, we really want to see that in double digits. At CEC, so really we need to try to double that. Um, you know, getting back to low pH, you know, you've seen a lot of this. Obviously, we're going to have you know, decreased micro microbial activity, which makes sense, right? It's an acidic environment. Those microbes are you know, living organisms, not going to want to live in an acidic environment. And again, think about that synergis synergistic effect of, of that soil. So, if your microbes aren't happy, they're, they're not going to live in that. You're not going to have that synergistic effect. Um, decreased or increased thatch level, um, that kind of goes hand in hand with those microbes, right? So, a lot of those microbes, their job is to eat that thatch. If they're not in there or they're not healthy, they're not going to be able to you know, eat that thatch and decrease that layer. Um, you know, decreased water infiltration, <coughs> that's common sense too, right? You get more thatch, that water's going to run off, so I'm going to get down to the soil where it needs. Um, bigger, overall bigger is going to be suffering. Uh, macronutrient availability, we showed that in that, you know, that colored slide previously. And then um, increased availability of aluminum in the root zone. So uh, aluminum is one of those micronutrients that, you know, just like the human body, plants need that in small doses. The problem with aluminum is when it's in an acidic environment, it becomes more soluble, right? So as that acidic environment dissolves that aluminum, becomes more available to the plant, almost to a toxic level. And here's an example of that. So on the right is the healthy root system growing in a you know, neutral pH. Far left is stunted root growth because of that aluminum toxicity. Something we don't think about you know, overall, it's more of a, a really you know, dived in, you know, dove in diagnostic test. Something to kind of keep in mind of what that pH is. Um, on the opposite side, you know, a high pH, which we're not going to see much here. Um, you know, typically see pHs high when you go to the coast, right? High salt content usually raises the pH. Or if we go out west, you know, they don't get much rain. Again, high salt content, they're not flushing out those salts. They, they're dealing a lot with um, sediment rocks and things like that. <clears throat> that. That really are high pH. So the symptoms are going to be very similar, right? Um, by looking you know, visually. Again, decreased macro micronutrient availability. Overall, turf grass bigger, um, you know, stunted wilted leaves or stem development. Again, microbial activity is going to be minimal. Um, spots, leaf necrosis. You know, again, with the importance of soil tests, you know, these symptoms are very similar, whether it's a pH uh, low issue or pH high issue. So, here's a you know kind of different way of looking at. Um, in that color graph I showed a couple slides ago. To me, this really brings it home. So if you look at the 6.5 pH, 
you're getting 90% of your availability. So, not those any distributors in here or not. But you could go in and say, hey, Mr. Distributor, I want the most expensive fertility fertilizer bag you have. I've got a high end client, I need to have the best product for their, for their lawn. If your pH is only five and a half to five, you're only getting 50% of that fertilizer. So you're going to spend, especially now, the cost of fertilizers, you know, really gone up in the last five years. If your pH isn't at least six and a half, I mean, you're almost wasting your money, right? You're going to have to fertilize more often because that availability is not there. Um, same thing on the high side. Again, I know we're talking to, you know, Eastern North Carolina here, so you're not going to see high pHs typically. Same scenario, right? You go from 6.5 to eight, you know, you're getting less than half of that fertility. So super important to, to make, you know, make sure you know what pH you have and then, um, if it is a problem, let's try to correct it because otherwise you're wasting your time, you're wasting thought. Does it make sense so far? Yeah. So <clears throat> this kind of varies on uh, what source you look at, but you know, pH adaptability of different turf grass. I know most here we're managed turf grasses, right? Most of these most folks in here. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to vary a little bit. I think 5.4 on that, that bottom tall fescue. I know a lot of us are trying to manage tall fescue. That's probably a little low. Probably needs to be a little closer to six. But it's somewhat tolerable. Of, you know, some some lower pHs. But again, that sweet spot is going to be close to six on most of what we're trying to do. All right, you with me so far? I know it's late in the day. <clears throat> we'll get through this. Uh, okay, so. I'm actually going to use an example here, uh, which was actually done in Centennial Campus at NC State. This was back a few years ago. Um, I believe this is the new library on Centennial Campus. And they, I'm sure you've all seen these retention ponds. Maybe some of you have been involved in building these. But essentially, these retention ponds, if you haven't seen how they're built, they've got about you know, four feet of an engineered soil in there that's real light and fluffy. It's made to almost be a filter for runoff. So, um, you know, in this case, there was runoff from a nearby parking lot. A lot of downspouts from the, the building were going into this with the idea that we're going to filter this soil, you know, filter this water before it goes into a nearby stream or an underground aquifer. Um, the problem with that is that it goes through a lot of, you know, wet and dry cycles, right? So um, they need to put plants in there they can tolerate these extremes. So what happens is, who knows what's running off that parking lot, right? I mean, it might be a leaking oil or antifreeze from a car, um, whatever chemicals are in that roof that's coming off there. So again, that, that engineered soil is in there to try to buffer that and filter that out. <clears throat> but what happens over the long term is, you know, plants start looking chlorotic. So, um, you know, we at Miriam and Shireen, we're, we're brand new to the market. We thought this would be a perfect opportunity to kind of test of some of the you know, kind of practices we preach. Let's talk about you know, using some of these alternative products to try to you know, change the look of these plants, change the pH, change the seeds of this soil. So if you look at the top in red, that's that original soil test that we took. Again, this came from state, um, you know, 5.2 pH, which obviously is super low. 5.0 CEC, again, that's low, and we want to see that in double digits. <clears throat> the bottom is an after, um, I know if you can't read that date at the top, that's uh, you know, <clears throat> 10, 1, 14, and then almost a year later, 7, 9, 15 is when we took a follow-up test. So um, here we look at that top circle with the line through at the top recommending that, that Lyme application. You know, we've been doing Lyme for years, right? And Lyme does a pretty good job of changing pH. The problem with that is, well, there's really two problems. One, it takes a long time to work, right? Usually it's a wintertime application. We're doing that, um, you know, we're done with beef season. It's not pre-emergent season. We're, we're kind of doing that for two reasons. You know, one, when we need to get some billing in, right? It's slow time of year, let's put a Lyme application up. <clears throat> Secondly, we know it's going to take a long time to work. So, you know, usually it's months. So, um, that's one problem. It takes a long time to work. Secondly, 
it's short lived, right? This is a you know seasonal thing. It's it's expensive. It's you know in the sustainability world, it's you're kind of chasing your tail. So <clears throat> we're going to put a line through that and say, okay, let's not do the line. Let's try to do something else. Um, so what we did is we took. And I've got a a sample up here we can pass around if somebody wants to see it. We have a product we call Carbonized PM, and I'll turn this into a sales pitch, but it's essentially a uh, concentrated amount of carbon combined with organic compost. And it does a couple of different things in the soil. Um, one of those is helping to change that pH in a, in a more permanent state. So what we did is we came in and we applied, and these plants were, were already in the ground, so we applied this kind of over the top. And uh, you can do this over the top, you can mix this in a backfill. Obviously, it's easier to mix it in when you're planting. Um, these plants were already in that, in that um, retention pond, so we kind of had to deal with what we had to do. So, if you look at the orange bar, that's the original soil test. So, these were several samples within that same flower retention pond. So, you can see at the low end, we've got that 5.2 pH. The, the best one we had was right at six, but that's several samples within within that uh, retention bond. And that's simply what you want to do with the soil test, right? You, want to, you don't want to just take one sample. You need to kind of take a representative sample because there might be a different concentration of nutrients or microbes that might throw something off. You need to kind of you know, take several to make that a more balanced approach. So um, so the orange is, is, is you know, let's call that the control. We applied our, one of our liquid biostimulants, we applied that soil amendment that I just talked about. We took a, uh, a test you know, almost one year later and look at the look at the difference in green. Um, so, you know, you know, if I didn't mention this or if you don't know this, um, pH is logarithmic, right? So to move from one point to the next, it's 10 times to go from say a five to a six. So it's, it's really, really difficult to move, especially in one application to move uh, pH that much. You can't, even fast acting high calcium line usually doesn't react that way. So, <clears throat> and if it does, again, it's something that has to be done annually. Um, this happened to be, you know, almost a year later, we're still seeing the positive effects of that one application. So, you know, I don't want to oversell this and, you know, over promise under, under delivery. You don't always see results that, hey, one application is changing this forever. But this is a perfect example of, hey, let's, you know, if you think outside the box of what we've been doing for the last 15 years and think maybe there's different alternative methods um, to what we're doing. I mean, again, I've been doing this a long time. Um, I've seen a lot of products come and go. Um, I've always been you know, a little bit skeptical just you know, by my training and my, um, you know, my background. But, you know, it wasn't too long ago that, um, Organic-based products almost had like a negative connotation, right? I mean, I'm probably one of the lowest people in here, I think. But to you in the past, you at least almost mock you know, organic-based products, right? <clears throat> a couple of reasons. They were usually really expensive. Uh, most of the time they didn't work. And if they did work, they took a long time to work. So just, you know, for anybody that's you know, my age or older, that's maybe a little bit stuck in their ways, just try to keep an open mind as we're going through this. Um, we've come a long way in the industry, not just as you know, our products, which is you know, the industry in general, um, organics are, you know, have come a long way. I mean, they're a little bit more cost effective than they used to be. They're certainly more effective. And I'm not here to say that organics are the answer and we all need to hug trees and give up, um, you know, synthetic uh, chemicals and fertility. I think there's a happy medium, but we just kind of need to keep an open mind that, hey, we can change some things for the better. So similar scenario, right? So here's CECs. So again, the orange is going to be the, the control. Um, all low, you know, all single digits. That's not where we want to be. We need to be double digits. In most cases, again, one application, we've doubled these CECs essentially. So that's almost unheard of to try to double CECs in one application of a product. In this case, it was essentially two products, a lyle stimulant and that soil amendment. Um, but you know, it really kind of opened our eyes like, hey, you know, this is proving, you know, we're kind of practicing what we're preaching. This is almost a year later, these, these benefits are still holding true. 
So <clears throat> visual signs of, of poor soil, we've kind of talked about this a lot, this can be common sense, right? Um, standing water compaction, it's a huge issue here with our heavy clay soils. Um, you go out west where there's always droughts, they don't get enough rain, they don't have good soil. Cracked soils, poor growth, you know, disease from you know, fungus and bacteria. So again, just like you know, the human body, animals in general, plants, um, you know, think of your soil health as kind of gut health, right? So, you know, there's a lot of um, studies being done on the importance of soil, of, of gut health, with your overall body health, right? Inflammation, um, possible precancers, things like that. Very similar to the bacteria and the, um, you know, the beneficial fungus in the soil. So, you know, kind of getting back to, you know, we're talking about you know, synthetics and organics and that sort of thing. Uh, we've all been guilty of this, including myself, that you know, in the past we've been really quick to throw a let's throw a fix at it, let's put a chemical, let's put a fertilizer, a fungicide, uh, insecticide on a, a so-called problem. And I know you probably can't you can't read this. Um, these are actually micronutrient or macronutrient deficiencies. This is actually corn, um, but really it doesn't really matter. Corn is you know essentially a giant grass. What this is showing is some um, nutrient deficiencies. And a lot of times we've seen these, like, hey, I've got some off color in my, in my grass. It must be a fungus. Let's go out and put a fungicide out. Well, or it's insecticide. I see some lesions here. Um, I must have you know, chinch bugs or whatever it is. Let's put an insecticide out. <clears throat> the problem with that is that most of those are you know, typically like a non selective, right? So. Just like the human body, there's going to be hopefully more you know, beneficial microbes inside that soil, inside that plant, than there are harmful. What you're doing is you're killing both, and then that population has to rebuild. So you just again kind of keep in mind to take more of a holistic approach, if you will, or um, like in and agree that that's managed we've heard for years. So just you kind of keep that in mind that hey. It's not always going to be you know, a chemical solution. It may be frost damage. It might be a, a nutrient deficiency. All right, so you know, we've kind of mentioned this before. Lime applications, we're going to raise the pH, right? Um, sulfur applications are typically done to lower pH. Again, that's not an issue in this part of the state. You know, gypsum, um, you know, that may or may not be used too much. I, I see that more of that when I travel out west again. Um, some severe soil issues with compaction. You know, there's a lot of salts in the soils out there. They need to add gypsum to kind of you know, change that soil structure. But you know, the problems with those, we talked about the lime applications, right? Some annual, short-lived um, application. Gypsum, you have to use really a ton of gypsum to try to make a change. So this, you know, this kind of goes back to. Um, that you know, systemic you know, kind of uh, IBM approach. Again, common sense, we all kind of know this, right? Whatever we're applying on top of that soil, on top of that turf, it's gonna end up downstream somewhere, right? It's gonna go into an aquifer, it's gonna into a lake or stream. We're all educated people in here, you know, it comes out of our budget, we're not gonna know, knowingly over apply products. A lot of times our industry gets a bad rap because, you know, hey, we're over applying, we're polluting the world. Um, a lot of times it's homeowners that Think a little is good, you know, more must be better type of thing. So a lot of times they're to blame, but we kind of get the brunt of it, but you guys get the idea. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of this here. Um, talk about building soil. So <clears throat> you know, there's different things we can do for amendments, right? Most of what we're trying to talk about is organic amendments. You know, think about um, you know, mulches and compost. Um, things like that. You don't see many, you look at this inorganic amendment, um, that's more at the, you know, maybe the golf course level, sports field level, you know, think about like fired clays, um, pea gravel, things like that. It's not normally a, something we see in like a landscape setting. So, you know, I, I talked real quickly about that, um, what we're calling carbonized DN, which is carbon plus nutrients. So it's biochar carbon combined with organic nutrients, so PN, so carbon plus nutrients. Kind of what it looks like, you can see a handful of that. 
real rich and organic looking. Um, really the workhorse of that is that um, is that biochar carbon. So if you see that slide over there with that porous structure, that honeycomb structure, that's really what's doing a lot of the work. So we take that, that, um, that carbon under the microscope and look at that porous structure. Think about that getting into our heavy clay soils. That's instant porosity for that soil, right? So that's you know room for that um, for air and, and water exchange. It's actually home for microbes to kind of go in and out of. Um, can help actually you know increase in drainage, which you need in most of our native soils. <clears throat> the other thing it's doing is helping balance the pH. It's got kind of a, a strong negative charge to it. So most of your most of your soil has a positive charge. It almost forms a bond. And it wants to, to bring that bond into what the pH is of that carbon. So in this particular case, we're using this carbon to help change that pH. We, we test this every level, um, comes in about 6.3 on the pH scale. So it almost makes a dummy proof, whether we have a high or low pH. It's, it's trying to bring that into that 6.3 range, which again is ideal for most of the plants we're trying to grow. So um, it really does do a couple really good things in the soil. Then the other half of what's in that in that bag is organic compost. So again, most of our you know, soils are really low in, in compost, I mean, in organic material. So when you can add some good organic material, you're gonna raise that CDC and then help increase that you know, microbial activity. Um, you know, something else to kind of think about is, is organisms in the soil, right? I mean, we don't obviously want to see voles and moles you know, through our front lawn or, or our gardens, but you know, if they're out in a pasture or um, maybe a place kind of out of the way in a natural area, let them kind of do their thing. You know, they kind of help aerate the soil. Um, you know, they're they're pooping and doing their thing. They're adding you know, organic material into the soil. Obviously, earthworms and microscopic nutrients are enhancing that soil. So, you know, these are all affected when we do you know, certain pesticides that may kill some of this stuff, and then that soil has to build back up with these, with these organisms. Um, you know, this last slide is just kind of showing we can kind of grow biology by combining that carbon and that compost with looming, you know, positive, you know, beneficial microbes, um, you can essentially creating biology. The right slide is, is, is important to kind of think about the plant as maybe the tip of an iceberg. So you see a tiny little plant with the naked eye on the right there, above ground. There's so much more going on that we can't see below ground, almost like a, you know, like I said, like a, like an iceberg. Um, that's really where the you know, kind of magic happens. So I'm just gonna show a few photo examples. I know we only got a couple minutes left. Um, you know, here's some of this, this carbonized beam we talked about going out onto a new golf course fairway before they spray it. Uh, this is a top reservoir, obviously, pushing that material out. Um, here's a golf green down in Florida. Again, if there's you know any better sales pitch, I don't know what it would be, but you know, even if you're not a golfer, you probably understand the importance of golf green. So if these folks are trusting this product to, to go on life and blood, you know, with the golf course uh, before they seed or spray. <clears throat> it means something, right? They're putting this down for a reason. Um, here, probably doesn't show up very good on this photo, but on the left side, this is a beat up driving range. Um, a lot of divots in there. This superintendent is doing one pass with that carbonized PM to try to fill in these divots, get some lateral growth, and fill that in. And this is in Virginia in October, so if you think about Virginia, they're probably even a little cooler than we are. You think Bermuda's probably going to be. You know, shutting down by then. We did have one pass. <clears throat> Three weeks later, you can see that those divots have filled in. You can see to the right and to the left, uh, they're still you know, slowly trying to fill in. So no changes in that, just simply adding that top press. Let's skip over a couple of these. This may not show up great on the slide. This is one of the first trials I did just to kind of on my own. This was at a, a lawn, um, one of our distributors. And it's a hodgepodge of different grasses. There's some Norman Bermuda, there's some fescue, they're trying to promote fescue in there. Um, 
this was in March, so it's just kind of everything's kind of coming out of dormancy. So I took a handful of that carbonized pea and I got a chicken petted out in these within this you know this marked log. Took a couple ounces of our um, of our bile stimulant, put it in a five gallon bucket of water. I dumped it out there, took that picture, and then three weeks later, <clears throat> the the manager of this facility sent this to me and said, you're not going to believe how green this is compared to everything else. It stayed that way for about two months before the rest of it caught up. And they're trying to promote fescue here. And, you know, this is a super low input lawn, right? This gets, I think they do a uh, pre merging in the spring with like an 1804. And then in the fall, they do a starter fertilizer. And that's the only fertility it gets. So to me, this is a perfect example um, hey, there's there's some nutrients in this soil that aren't being utilized. I mean, most of us are at least applying more than two applications a year. In this case, this is it. Let's look how much greener that is. Just you know, this kind of proves to me that like, hey, there's there's some nutrients in there that aren't being utilized by that plant. There's probably some some dormant you know, biologicals in there. We need to kind of woke it up. And we did that with one application and stayed green like that for two months. Um, a couple of golf course photos. Again, we're very golf heavy. A lot of superintendents share photos with us. This is a superintendent sent this to me in November, uh, back in, in August. And he applied that carbonized skin and some squares in a test plot on some fairways back in August. And he kind of forgot that he did it. He kept some records, luckily. But they had a heavy frost, their first frost in November. And again, this is in Atlanta. And he's driving by and he says, what are these green squares in my apparel? He had to go back and look at his notes. So, you know, several months later, these didn't get the frost damage that the rest of the golf course did. This is, you know, 419 Bermuda. Um, so, you know, to me, if I'm, you know, managing, say, a shopping center or, you know, entranceway into a subdivision, it's all about curb appeal, right? If I can stay greener than my customer down the street, I look like a hero, right? I'm not putting out more fertility. I'm just enhancing that soil, making this plant healthier. Um, again, some more golf so photos, doing some trials here with some sod on uh, a private club outside of Charlotte. <clears throat> May not be able to see this, but there's the control with nothing. The, the carbonized key in on the right. Look at the root growth there, that's three days. I came back after about nine days. I couldn't even pick up the sod, I had to go back there and actually find a corner and try to lift it up. And this was Bermuda, um, but we see this around the country, where there's bent grass, uh, tall fescue. Within three or four days, we see tremendous, you know, light healthy roots coming out. Some divots, um, straight sand on the left, 25% of the Miramichi carbonized being mixed in. Three weeks later, straight sand versus carbonized being, it's almost completely filled in. Again, that lateral growth. Um, I know I'm in NC State, it's probably a batch photo to show. <laughs> this was the first um, first big uh, um, fall field project I was involved with. So here, the, and, and, and just to save face, Casey actually went to NC State for turf grass management. So it's still in his blood in NC State, but he's working at NC, uh, UNC. But he's applying carbonized skin out on Keenan Stadium before they saw it. So we put that out, put our biosimile out over the top of the soil. He laid the sod that day. So he calls me a couple weeks later and says, hey, Mike, when do you think I can air it? And so I'm, I have to be driving when he called me. And I said, man, it's not even been a month yet, has it? And he said, no, it's like you know, 14, 15 days. And I said, man, what do you think of putting an aerator on your two-week-old sod? He said, I've got some dips and some low spots I want to fill in. So I want to aerate, let the cores dry out, drag that in his top wrist, and kind of fill that in. Um, and I've, I've been around trying to pick that sod up, and it's it's tacked down. I said, man, you got more gumption than me. I'm going to put an aerator on brand new sod. This is the photo he sent me, and again, this is 14, 15 days in. And those of you who haven't seen these kind of aerators before, it's adjustable. He's got that thing almost to the most aggressive setting to the right. You can see that very close spacing. He's almost, almost essentially tilling that um, brand new sod up. He said there are only a couple spots to lift it up. That was, you know, I guess, like 15 days old. <clears throat> Here it is three weeks later. So 
it's ready to play um, in three weeks. It's almost unheard of. So it's part of the regimen. It's actually part of you know NC State on the campus. We're using a lot of this in not even a ball field, but um, you know, around, around the campus ground. Um, last slide, and I'll, I'll kind of end on on this. This is actually in my parents' house. So they moved in. They live uh, kind of on the border of Georgia North, in uh, South Carolina, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. They retired down there a few years ago. And they lived there for about three years. This is single stem Natchez freight marble. And in three years that they lived there, it had never bloomed. It would look just like this photo on the left. I took this July 4th weekend. <clears throat> it would leaf out in the spring, look like this all summer, drop its leaves, do the same thing again next year. So my dad's giving me hell, you know, one time I'm visiting and said, hey, you know, we sent you to school to be a superintendent at Ohio State. It's supposed to be smart, know about all this stuff, get all these great products. You need to, fi you need to fix my tree. So you know, luckily I had some, some samples with me. And uh, you can barely see that I put out and some of that carbonized being on around the root ball of the plant. I, you know, I, I dug back the um, the mulch head around there. Put a ring of that, that carbon carbonized being around the tree. I just took a little claw digger, you know, a little garden digger type thing. <clears throat> and I put a couple ounces of our liquid biostimulant in a five gallon bucket. And I slowly drenched that in and I was drenching it in. Just kind of worked that claw digger, digger in to try to work that carbon into the soil. So I took that picture on the left before I left and it was for the July weekend. I told my parents to keep an eye on it. I didn't know if it would take, you know, three weeks, seven weeks, whatever. But I knew it would help, but I just didn't know how long it would take. It was almost five weeks to the day. My mom sent me this picture on the right. So again, the first time it ever bloomed in the three years they lived there, and it grew about a foot. And that was all that was done. I didn't, you know, I promised again, my mom or myself were smart enough not to do Photoshop. This is just right off her her iPhone. So really, really simple. I mean, those of you that maybe are turf grass heavy like myself, um, you're already on that property, right, with your customer, and hopefully they trust you there every week. Um, think about maybe doing some tree and shrub applications. It's not that difficult. Uh, again, they hopefully they trust you because you're out there every week anyway. Um, and obviously, if it's a you know, certain situation with borers or you know some diseases and things, it's going to be a different type of control. But a lot, you know, I don't know if this was root pound they put it in. Um, maybe it's container grown and you know sit in a pot for, for too long. Maybe they didn't take the wire basket off and it's, it's root pound that way. Who knows? But, Either way, one application, this, this thing is back to normal. So, um, you know, just kind of a, um, you know, some, I like to just kind of show pictures either I've involved, been involved with, or at least kind of know the story behind what was going on. So, um, I know I'm running out of time here. Is there, are there questions? I know it's kind of a lot to run through here at the end of the day. Um, yes, sir. So, uh, So this was, to be honest with you, we didn't do a real good job of measuring this. It was a little less than 40 pounds per thousand. Um, so, and that's a good point. I mean, I, I, I knew the, the owners of Beer Beach Green for a couple of years before I uh, decided to come and work for them. <clears throat> and I kind of had in my mind, again, I'm old school, so when he was, you know, tell me that you know, this product goes out at 20 to 40 pounds per thousand, I'm kind of scratching my head thinking, you know, how can you even see the grass and put it out 40 pounds per thousand? <clears throat> but I'm thinking in terms of fertilizer, right? So, you know, fertilizer we're normally putting out at four, four to five pounds per thousand. Um, so we have to think about, we're trying to amend the soil. This is not a, not a fertilizer program. So if you go down even five or six inches in your soil, think about how much volume of material that takes to change that. So we put this in 40 pound bags for a reason. It kind of makes the math easy. You know, if, you know, if everything's kind of hunky dory, you know that um, your pH is not a lack, your fertility seems to be working good year after year. We say, hey, 20 pounds per thousand as a goal per year is kind of ideal. If we're having issues, you know, say that fertilizer we've used for years doesn't work or the pH is off, you probably need to go 40 pounds per year or more to get that changed. So in that case that you're talking about, 
it was probably a little less than 40 pounds to make that change. For that, for changing that pH, absolutely, it's just carbon because it's got that negative charge. It's bringing those positive soil colloids into what its charge is, which is about 6.3. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you again. I know it's been a long day. I appreciate it.